Good evening, New Bedford Guide. Uh, good evening, South Coast residents. My name is Chris Rosendis. Uh, tonight we have some special guests to me because the sheriff was actually my first guest. Good evening, New Bedford Guide. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Good evening, South Still having mistakes. Uh, and he's back again tonight. Uh, we're going to discuss a few issues, national issues, some local stuff. John Oliver is back to discuss his uh, ongoing turmoil as the uh, school committee elect member. Uh, John has uh, run into some uh, issues with the uh, outgoing superintendent that we hope we can get resolved soon. Uh, Y'all heard my piece that watched the show last week on how I feel that her sticking around for the remainder of the year is actually counterproductive, uh, especially when she has a no trespass order against a sitting uh, school committee member that's actually going to find her a replacement. Uh, to me, that's, that's impeding progress, and we need to, to take care of that and uh, deal with that. We'll hear from John. Also, uh, I made a few posts. Uh, today I actually went live from the uh, Cask and Pig in Dartmouth. Uh, what I'm doing, along with a couple of uh, pretty stellar guys in the community, Manny DeBrito, who's been on the show, New Bedford uh, Elections Commissioner, uh, Christian Farlin, who's a business owner, and man, this guy's everywhere doing good things for the community. He teamed up with me, and uh, Edwin Cartagena from uh, uh, United New Bedford, excuse me, uh, is teamed up with me. We're going to uh, do a toy drive, guys. We're going to get these kids from Puerto Rico that have relocated to New Bedford, make them, welcome them into the New Bedford area with a great Christmas. Uh, we're going to gather some toys for them, gift cards, anything you can find in your heart to give, whatever you can afford is uh, greatly appreciated. On the flyer provided, uh, New Bedford Package Ship, Christian Farland over at Farland Corp, uh, Ritual Sweat Society, South Coast Krav Maga, Craven's Cafe in Dartmouth, Pasta House in Fairhaven, Cask and Pig. Salon V in New Bedford. Uh, Nellie and Chris Weddings is offering a photo package that we're going to raffle off towards it. Steven and Company, JNS Guns and a Cushion. It. All these are drop off locations, folks. They are all offering incentives to donate. Uh, Myra's matching toys. Some people are offering discounts. I will go and uh, to discuss this with the uh, sponsors throughout next week, and uh, we can discuss getting them to have a successful drive along with myself and my partners in this uh, endeavor and get these kids ultimately the Christmas they deserve. Uh, with no further ado, my first guest tonight is Sheriff Tom Hodgson from the Bristol County uh, Sheriff's Office. Good evening, Sheriff. How are you tonight? Great. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for uh, coming. Uh, Sheriff, uh, you were my first guest. Uh, and uh, that night I was clicking pens and tapping pens and you gave me a lot of constructive criticism, chewing gum, saying um every sentence. And uh, we, we, we've grown a little bit since you've left. I think I'm on episode 13, 14, as I had discussed with you earlier. And you guys are doing awesome. Yeah, man, we're, we're getting out there. Uh, it's actually a good feeling right now. I've been able, along with, I've had a great lineup. I say it, like, every, all my guests that I've had, it's like a pro baseball player having a softball, like, soft toss to them. And it's just, all right, let me ask the questions and let them run with it. And it's, it's been great. It's been a good run. We've helped a lot of people, raised a lot of awareness on different important topics, and uh, we're going to continue with that tonight. Uh, let's start off, Sheriff, uh, unfortunately, with the loss of a former SCAT member, SCAT being the South Coast uh, Anti-Crime Task, Anti Task, Task Force. Excuse me, I had a brain fart. Uh, Wally Garcia, good man. Uh, we had spoke, I had spoken on him when he, we first lost him. Uh, Wally, I remember Chase, I grew up in Dartmouth. Uh, I remember him chasing me, and actually he booted me in the butt one time real good out of the woods one day. We had a few beers back there, and he, he got me out of there, and he, he got me where I needed to be, you know. He was a good yeah. man, old school police. Yeah. Uh, very nice. He put a smile on everybody's face. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, and he's not the only one. Some guys I used to work with when I was with you have also chosen that path uh, of suicide. It's unfortunate, and it's actually... Uh, ties in with the whole uh, mental illness campaign that I'm trying to start up here in the South Coast area along with the South Coast hospitals. Do you offer some program and some assistance through chaplains or whatever in, the, in, in your department that will actually help these officers get the help they need? Because the suicide rate amongst correction officers is extremely, extremely high. Yeah. Uh, people don't realize the job. People just say, oh, you're in the attorney keys, but they don't realize that Deep down within, and I worked with some serious, tough guys back in the day. They were scared, you know? You're, you're a little nervous, and that's a weird situation when you got to put on that mask and that shield, and, you know, and inside, there's days where you walk out and you're like, and I escaped something, you know? And that uh, day after day after day after day of that 
wondering if today's the day that something bad is going to pop off can really do a number on the brain. Are you yeah. helping out your offices with this? We are, and you raise a, a very important point. You know, law enforcement and corrections, um, most everyone that gets into the job in the very beginning do so because they want to make a difference. They want to save the world. I remember when I started out as a cop, I was like, man, we're going to get the bad guys off the street. We're going to protect people. But suddenly what happens is um, your world, 95 to 99% of your world becomes very negative. It's what you live day in and day out. You see the worst of everything, uh, particularly on the street as a cop. You see the worst. Whether, whether it's uh, two people getting in an accident, nobody's at fault you still walk away with a negative. Yeah. And, and after a while, that's why all, police officers have such a difficult time because they, they have to build this wall and sometimes it's the only way they can survive. And then they tend not to think that anybody else understands what they're going through. They don't want to relive it. They don't want to take it home and talk about the, the fatal accident they just saw or what have you, so they bury it. And, but what happens is over time, the bricks build up and they become very heavy. And unless you know how to properly deal with those things or have the resources within your department, you can run into situations where, where it becomes so overwhelming for some people, depending on their personality and so forth, um, that it can lead to the kind of thing that happened um, with Wally and others. And so, so it's important to make sure that you have uh, outreach and resources available and you let your staff know about it. We actually um, have had an uh, EAP program employee assistance program mm -hmm. with an outside group and they still are part of our organization and they provide those kinds of places that people can go uh, to talk about things that are maybe weighing heavily on them. And now we've also recently started a uh, Bristol County uh, stress unit within our, our own organization where we have staff who have stepped up and volunteered to um, be the outreach person or people on both the civil and the security side. So, the, in fact, I just finished writing a memo today about it and why um, uh, it's important in those days when this job may seem overwhelming to you and you feel you want to talk to somebody that we now have people who serve online, who do the same thing you do, who are there to help guide you or direct you to a more professional place. Absolutely. But you'll have somebody that can listen and, and, um, and start to give you a, sort of a brighter perspective looking toward where you can get help to to get back to the place that you yeah, otherwise tough. feel good. I mean, it's tough. I, I, I know when I worked there, and I only worked there a few years, suicide attempts, guys slicing their wrists, uh, doing all kinds of stuff. And one that really stuck with me, I can't name his name, obviously, but uh, it was a kid I went to school with that actually took his own life. And yeah, he was, he was uh, a jailer. And... Uh, Man, and he saw myself, and I was on an overtime shift overnight, and we did the switches to keep ourselves fresh. And he ran into myself, a girl that I went to school with too, and another kid that I used to, that used to. So each shift, it was like it was an outside rotation. It was like people he grew up with, and finally, I guess that kind of got in his head or something because as soon as it went to a stranger, he committed yeah. suicide. You well, know? you know, it's interesting. Even in the case of Wally, I mean, I was at the at the wake talking to some of the Dartmouth guys said listen we went through this not too long ago yeah and the problem is that everyone tends to to try to figure out you know what did, did I miss something people look to try to see if they could have been the ones that maybe was looking for some reason which you never really can find you because you can't get into that person's mind at the time that that happened or no but I think people we all tend to say what could I have done to stop it because you, you don't want to see someone that you know or worked with, um, you know, no longer be part of your life. So, so the way that we tend to naturally do it, it's a natural response, is to say, but did I miss something? Could there, could there have been something I could have done? Did we, should we have done more? Uh, um, that's a good thing to think about, about could we do more, because you want to make sure that if there is a telltale sign that you can look it's just like for other else. things. You always go in past experiences, and unfortunately sure. sometimes it takes a bad experience to learn from it and move forward and implement sure. protocol. That but I, I commend you for, for really taking on this issue around mental health and well, trying to really look for solutions. Cause it's near and dear to my heart. I have a close friend, and uh, his aunt is actually someone that's a high-ranking official in your, uh, was in your department. And he's a best friend of mine. And uh, he's, he's been diagnosed with bipolar, depression, anxiety. Yeah. My wife 
has had like anxiety moments where I didn't even notice, you know. So it's something that means something to me, and uh, and a lot of people hide it at times. Sure. And my friend tells me it's easier for me to talk about some of the weirdest crap I've done and bad stuff I've done to a girl that I'm starting to date rather than telling her I'm bipolar. Yeah. And it took him a long time to get help. And I actually, some of his family members still think it's him that's causing this mental illness. And it, it bothers me a lot. It gets under my yeah. it gets in my nerves. And, and it ties into the loss recently at the uh, sheriff's department and a guy that I worked with, a lieutenant out there, and a good guy. But had he, and he was like, you know, hard as a rock. He had that look forward, muscular build. You know, he's a squared away guy. And he was hurting inside. Yeah. And part of the campaign I'm trying to do is get the guy like that, the big muscle guy. The, and men have a hard time with dealing with mental illness because it's like the bravado thing. You know, right. they, gotta, they gotta hide behind it. What I wanna do is, hey man, it's okay. Right. I want to put faces on billboards and say, I have it too. Yeah. We deal with it. There's a fix to this. You know, you're sick down from the neck down. My friend Eric tells says this all the time, but you're crazy from the head up. That's your, you're sick all the way through. Yeah, of course. And there's a solution to it and we can work for it. Yeah, you know? and it's a lot of it is just, you know, and not all of it, but a lot of it is, you know, we, it's understanding that, that the things that you continually think about that may be trouble or problems are things that have already happened it's history yes. but if you keep repeating it and living it there's no solution to it because you can't undo it so you, you can't just push it to the side yeah you know what i mean and, and, you, and you have a, to you learn a pile of crap in the corner of the house it's going to smell like how the house is going to smell like crap no matter what no yeah. matter where you hide it you know what but I mean? it's learning to it's learning to understand yeah. that okay it's normal i don't have to be ashamed exactly um it's a good thing that i do react to certain things that are upsetting to me and and not feel like I can't because then when you, you sort of bury those emotions that's when the that's when it it actually makes it worse. Yeah, what I've been it, reading and the research I've been doing. You're more human when you can when you can say, Hey listen, I'm hey I'm not, not any one of us is normal. No. Right? We all have we all have no, idiosyncrasies. Of, no, but our our, our 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 brains are mapped differently. Yes. I mean, you know, people have diabetes, people have other kinds of things. It doesn't make them you know, bad abnormal people. It's just that, and the brain works the same way. So, absolutely, yeah. I um, I'm going to segue this from a past guest who was in recovery, Jamie. He was actually misdiagnosed with bipolar, and he and he did have anxiety issues, but he attributed the misdiagnosis to the amount of drugs and alcohol he was intaking, and it was making his brain cause and create in the same. Patterns, I don't even know how, you know, I'm no scientist. I barely even know my regular job, and never mind this one, so I'm not going to delve into the, <laughs> the clinical world. But uh, basically, it gave him a false positive, all the drug usage. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Bristol County's got the high drug rate, uh, the high suicide rate, and, you know, you've addressed this issue, but we also have a tremendously high drug and alcohol rate in this area, in this region, and a lot of the incarceration is due to that. So a lot of these suicides can actually be attributed to the drugs and alcohol doing a number on the brain, as in the case of Jamie, where sure. it took actually almost a year of him being clean to finally get his brain where it needed to be, he said. You know, right. I mean, he knew where he was at that point, a year in, and I was there today. I had a crew working at PACA today. Yeah. Jamie's in charge, you know what I mean? It's, it's a wonderful thing once you get the brain cleansed. Well, we, we, we detox two-thirds more in Bristol County uh, than any other jail in the Commonwealth, and um, you detox. You said we detox two thirds more okay. than any other any other uh, county facility. There it goes. Now, now the other thing is too that, uh, to your point, there, there are now uh, some studies that are being done, and they're talking about the fact that once this mer they're very concerned about a um, um, an epidemic of schizophrenia. Absolutely. Once this marijuana thing really takes off, and people start. Uh, really getting into this marijuana, where it's marijuana legalized. And I people, actually read a few things read, on that. Yeah, and so <clears throat> look, these these mind altering drugs are not are, are not uh, the the solution. They never have been. Uh, people that seek out alcohol um, prior to legalization of marijuana or any of these other drugs, they if they sought it out to to bury their worries and solve their their problems that they're weighing on them, we know that that never was a solution. 
it only exacerbated the problem because yeah. alcohol is a depressant. So, Absolutely. so it's the same thing. You know, it's what I said about marijuana. Why would we want to add one more mind-altering drug that is not going to give you yeah. any uh, more well, benefit? I so, voted against it. And the people spoke, so the people spoke. Sure. And I'm, I'm all about government and giving the people a voice, and I'm going to have to abide by, the, by what they voted sure. for. Sure. But here's the thing. You hear a lot, I don't even want to touch upon mar marijuana, because we're actually going to do a couple shows on marijuana, but uh, just to start off where I, where I come in, as a kid I tried it, I did it, whatever, you know, and I don't see myself, there's two points to this. I don't see myself ever saying, hey, it was okay. Like, no, it wasn't okay. I couldn't go to work and function correctly. Sure. And here's the difference that a lot of people do with marijuana where they don't do with alcohol. You don't see a guy like if I say, hey, man, you want to go for a drink at 10 a.m. to the non-alcoholic. Man, i got to finish working. I can't drink. Right. But to the guy that's smoking weed, it seems okay to smoke weed at, at 10 o'clock. It's the same thing. Like right. it's altering. Like you just don't do it. Like if you want to and if you want to have a couple drinks at night, I'm one of those people who thinks that alcohol is way worse and scientifically it's proven than marijuana at times, you know, except for the psychosis with the new potent stuff. But uh, do it at night when everything's done, you know. Right. And then to my other point, I actually, I, I don't want to get into it because I don't want to get, go into a tangent about marijuana. Let's just talk about the mental health in inmates. And uh, you, you do what you can. You have limited resources. You're underfunded $9 million. But now we see this epidemic. We had detoxing more than anybody. Back in the day, we had a lot of uh, treatment facilities in the state. Governor Dukakis started shutting down these facilities during his tenure, and they never got opened back up. Right. So now we have this big problem that reappeared now. Because back then, it was like the end of crap. Like, you know what I mean? And he's, ah, we don't need these facilities anymore. And then now it's, we have this epidemic. We need right. to start reopening these facilities that right. are strictly based on detox and all that stuff. But it's still... A setting of corrections, a correctional setting. You know? Right. Have you worked with legislators and said, "Hey, man, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta flip this on its head." Like well, I'm yeah. a housing unit, but I don't have the resources. Those were shut down long ago by by Dukakis. We gotta do something now. Yeah, you know, um, that's that's a great question. Um, the the le the legislature has known for a long time that this is this is a big problem. Uh, when Dukakis started closing the mental health hospitals, the prisons became the mental health hospitals. That's not what we do. It's not what our people are trained to do. However, in our facility, uh, we have we have we've developed a behavioral unit. We actually uh, encourage these people to work their way out of a segregated situation that they had to be put in because they were acting out violent, either going to hurt another inmate, hurt themselves, or hurt one of our officers. And so, we even have. I think three or four other sheriff's offices that said they're worse people to us because we've mastered this through um, through the, our medical vendor who, the, the doctor who owns the company, actually is, is um, his, his forte is in suicides, so in mental health. So he, we've had the fortunate um, benefit of having someone who really is very focused in that area, has been through his whole medical career and uh, given us a sort of a better way of dealing with it. But the answer is not in the prisons. Uh, the legislature uh, needs to do what they, I think, understand needs to be done and put open up mental health hospitals, more treatment centers. Yes. You can talk all you want about, you know, look, re-entry, but if you have no beds to put people in, that's just rhetoric. The cat's out of the bag. I mean, everybody knows there's not enough beds in the state. There's not enough detox facilities in the state. People know that a seven-day detox does not work. Right. <laughs> you know, it's six months or more. Right. It just doesn't work, and it exponentially grows the success rate past that. Right. So you it's have... It's a no-brainer at this point. Like, what are we waiting on? Like, are we just going to make believe it doesn't exist? Because that, in Beacon Hill, it seems to be the case, you know? We're adding toll booths and on all kinds of... Uh, roads up and, you know, getting in and out of Boston, but where's that money going? Let's do something that's actually fighting the epidemic. I, I met with Dan Shores. Uh, I did a show with him, and as well as Jay McMahon, they both said, man, every office, including that of the office they're running for, the Attorney General's office, has to focus on this long-term treatment. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting. I mean, look, they, the legislature's just come out with this criminal justice reform. And uh, to your point, 
you, you can't band-aid these solutions. And what's happening is they filed legislation that basically says, that starts to dictate to us inside the prison, the sheriffs who have an executive role, how, how we're going to handle these mental health people, how long we can keep them in segregation, uh, th th with no knowledge of what we do day in and day out, as, as a sort of almost a some very shallow answer to a very deep problem, which is very common when you deal with, with legislators legislative uh, groups. Yeah, you said it right at the beginning of the and, 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 it's, and, and honestly, look, you don't, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a legislator, you don't, you don't tell NASA, stop using O-rings in your, in your space shuttles because a space shuttle blew up. Okay? The, 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 the scientists and the people that construct these things, that's what they do. Absolutely. So what, what you can do, though, is you can make sure that we have enough researchers money to make sure that when we ask for uh, the research to do the O-rings to make them you know, more secure, that you provide that. We don't want you to tell us, get rid of the O-rings, okay, because that's not the answer. And that's essentially what's happening uh, in this instance with dabbling into the... Yeah, it's, it's got to change. I mean, the evidence is out there. It's a nationwide issue. There's federal funding now that they could get. I mean, if they stop if they start playing nice with the federal government. Uh, uh, and it needs to get done. It's, it's in their back. There's no question. It's already, we're already past it needs to get done. It's, we're at long overdue at this point. Um, there are facilities. There are, you know, we can use sponsor type things. You know, there's all different solutions. We can yeah, use public private, private, public private yeah. partnerships, all that. You can do. I mean, they're doing it in Bridgewater. Right. They went, they went privatized. Uh, we can do more of that. Right. You know, and there's a solution to that. There's money in that, and everybody wins. Right, and that's the that and that's that's the approach. And it's to, and and bring the people in who do the job and talk to them. Ask them if you think that, you know, people are being in who have mental health issues or or maybe locked up too much inside of a prison. Ask the question of the people who do it every day and understand why they have to do it, and whether it turns out that they have to do it because it's a security risk and an issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, or whether it's because um, you all just haven't provided the monies necessary to give the appropriate venue for these people to keep them out of our prisons. In either case, you'll have the answer. But you can't just make them up as you go along and sort of dabble in it and come up with these Band-Aid approaches to things. By dabbling, are they even approaching you for any... Uh, any we not had, I have not had anybody ask me... So had the no same local with the, legislators from Bristol County say, hey, what can we do to change this, in your, in your opinion? No. No, and that's 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 the real difficult part. I mean, look, if you're going to get into the legislation on anything, I don't care if it has to do with with auto mechanics or whether it has to do with education, talk to the people in the business so that when you file the legislation, it doesn't end up being a thing that's going to muddy up the waters worse because it never really drilled down yeah. to the core of the problem where you could get a real legitimate solution. And so... So that's, that's, that's a flaw in the system. I think it's why we haven't seen things move along since Dukakis got rid of mental health hospitals for years because I think everybody knows there's going to be a cost factor. And that, that means it's going to require a little bit of work to figure out how you're going to get this done. Yeah. And, and, um, so we're behind right now, and they're still behind because they haven't started correct. doing the proper research. Correct. I just, yeah. Each week it blows my mind, and I sit here, and I'm actually in the middle of this uh, – process of trying to do this mental illness, well, uh, mental illness campaign, excuse me, starting to see how the money and the get impedes the process. Like, man, I just want to do this for free. Let's get this going. Yeah. You know, uh, you know it's interesting. My, my, I just uh, got a, a call from my sister who's been down in Puerto Rico uh, working on a relief effort. She's uh, been in Mass General for years, but she's been down there for already for a couple of weeks, could be a couple more. And she said, she first sent me a text and said, I have no idea how you deal with all of the bureaucracy <laughs> and all the layers of things to get anything done. She said, well, you're we're not, down you're here. You're not a good old boy either in Massachusetts. Yeah, so well, help. but, you know, she, I said, listen, uh, let me guess. You, 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 you're, you're having trouble getting the resources and the things like that. And what happens is you, when you start getting outside the realm of the people who are in, in, in the trenches doing the job, yeah. it starts to build into these layers of approval, uh, and then politics enters into it because then attorneys, you, yeah, and you want to take care of this one, and you want to take care of that one, and um, and and it just it's the system doesn't work well. No, 
And it's evident. It's right. quite evident, folks. The system doesn't work. And this is like, if you're as passionate as I'm trying to be, I'm not there yet. I'm not at the Eddie Casey, I mean, the uh, Jamie Casey. I'm not at the Kevin Rosario level when it comes to uh, addiction and help. But I'm getting there and I'm trying to get the word out there. Call your legislators and say, hey, get on it. Call Montigny. Call Pacheco if you're from Taunton. Call, uh, who's out in Fall River now? Uh, Senator Rodericks. Senator Rodericks, excuse me. Yeah, Senator Rodericks, uh, Representative Cabral. Get them to work with people like the sheriff. Like, write to them. Say, hey, listen, my cousin had an overdose. My cousin's in jail not getting proper treatment. Like, a seven-day detox is not good. Like, let's get this going. Like, that's how it starts. I know with myself being in the firearms industry and then being a representative of firearms owners in Massachusetts, we really dial the numbers and call the state house when the time comes and it's and it works trust me it does work when they tried ramming that bump stock legislation with the linsky uh language in it where he just started adding all kinds of craziness like oh yeah we're gonna get rid of bump stocks but we're gonna get rid of those pre-bands we already agreed to it worked it got, they took it out of the language get on the phone email call your legislators if you are passionate about getting this epidemic taken care of get on your phone get on your computer Write them, call them nonstop. Trust me, stuff will start happening if they start feeling the pressure from their constituents. The problem is that people say, "Oh, you know, hey, it sucks," and nobody does it. Right. That's a, that's a great I, point. I know firsthand it does work. Well, we're I'm working on something right now with um, some of the sheriffs, and um, we're, we're probably going to dub it Operation Call, mm -hmm. uh, which would stand for Call uh, Contact All uh, Legislative Leaders, and it really is focused on right now Washington DC on the on the immigration front but the idea is that we're we're looking at creating a national call day or days two days where the entire nation we're going to we're, we're we're building this network of of organizations of people who will reach out to their people the sheriffs will reach out to their people and we will do a a, a um, national call day or two where we will have everyone calling down to Washington and saying pass Kate's law. Uh, you work for us. Yeah. We don't work for you. And we want these 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 certain things addressed, and we want them addressed now. No more lollygagging around about yeah. it. You brought this up, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> let me just touch upon first. Last time we spoke, you had, uh, we'll, we'll move on, folks, from, from that part. Now we're going to move on to uh, a different topic of ISIS 287G program. When I was last here, you had them involved in that program, which basically deputizes them as uh, immigration agents through your department. Uh, have they graduated? Oh, they've graduated. Uh, in fact, our, one, of our, one of our officers graduated number one, and I'm very proud of that. That's awesome. But they all did very, very well. Good, good, good. And uh, with that program, uh, how long have they been active now since they've graduated? Oh, they've been, they've been active, I think, over a month now, maybe even a little bit longer than that. All right. As I think it was since August. I think they went in August. Yeah, there was... I spoke to you. So probably a couple months. In. So we were in September. A couple months since yeah, we've been we were in September. Imagine that. September uh, was like, felt like last hard week. Hard to believe. Uh, case law you brought up in the National Call Day. So I had that on here. Uh, case law was brought up by Representative Bob Goodlatte of uh, Virginia. Uh, it would increase penalties for deported aliens who try to return to the United States and are caught. So once you are deported and you retry reentry, uh, it's kind of lenient, the laws. So what Bob uh, Goodlett did was, uh, I'm probably butchering his name, um, introduced Kate's Law. Uh, it was named after Kate Stanley, the woman who was shot and killed by an illegal immigrant, Jose Zarate. He was discharged in a firearm in San Francisco by mistake, according to his defense, and uh, shot at a SEAL. <laughs> he said he was shooting at SEALs too, but it was by mistake, and uh, killed Kate Stanley. Uh, he was deported five times five times and he found his way back to the sanctuary city of San Francisco and he uh, was acquitted of murder involuntary manslaughter and assault with a deadly weapon none of those charges stuck in this case it's as a family member I would go crazy yeah. I would go absolutely crazy 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 it was a failure of justice on many ends uh, starting from the first time he got back came back into this country so now this law was introduced, and it was actually, the, it passed in the House, Kate's Law. And it wasn't just a, uh, a line vote. It was actually 24 Democrats who voted along and said, yeah, you know, this is the right thing to do. But now uh, it's, they won't get it. They won't table it. And, uh, it's been tabled in the Senate. 
Yeah. And well, this is where this is this is this is the problem. Um, how do you how do you look these families, the thousands of families in this country who have lost their loved ones, who but for for somebody illegal in this country who came in this in this country um, with without legal right and killed your loved one, but but for that. They, these families would be enjoying all kinds of, of memories that they'd be creating at Christmas this year and for years to come, but for the fact that, like in the case of, of Katie Steinle, Catherine Steinle, that her life was cut short in her father's arms, by the way. On you a know, pier in on San a pier Francisco. After like they you just had your lunch family together. vacation on the pier in San Francisco, she got killed there. Dad called her, right. said, well, you know, where are you? You available for lunch? Yep. They went for had a nice lunch. They were, they were strolling on the pier and leaving and in the middle of the afternoon and she dies in her father's arms. But here's the problem. When we have <clears throat> when we have people who are in in Congress who um, who table a law that would prevent maybe your family member or my family in the future from experiencing the exact same thing for political reasons. There's no other reason why. If somebody's re-entered this country after they've been deported, it's a felony anyway. Why would any elected official in this nation think it was okay if somebody already defied the laws and disrespected the laws of the United States, came in, got caught, got sent back out again after committing a crime, comes back again, why would you not want that person who's already shown a pattern of disrespecting our laws, to be held in jail so that they can't go out and kill someone else. Because that's your fundamental responsibility as an elected official. You took an oath. And the fundamental responsibility of government is to make sure, first and foremost, people are safe. If you don't have a safe community and a safe nation, you can't have a strong economy. You can't have good schools. You can't have any of those things. And so, but to the, to the, to the common person out there, nobody seems to understand why when law enforcement says this person is a threat, that you have elected officials who are saying, well, you know what? I have a political, personal political philosophy about this, and I don't think that the federal law um, should apply here. So I'm going to decide whether or not that person can be held or not against the advice of law enforcement who already has the information and knows the potential threat. And Kate Steinle is a perfect example. Let her out after all of these. This guy had five, seven felonies, I think. Came back into the country five times, and was released back out there to kill Kate Steinle. Yeah. Whether by accident or not, Chris. It, you know the what? Point you know, is, we, it's manslaughter at a minimum. Yeah. At, at the minimum, at the minimum, it's involuntary manslaughter because he picked up a firearm. Right. I mean, I just I, it blows my mind. And what does it say to the? I mean, if you listen to these heart wrenching stories, I was down at a meeting at the White House uh, with the president and these angel moms and dads, and I have to tell you. If you were sitting in that room, or anyone sitting in that room, your your heart was wrenching from listening to these stories. The kid, the kid who who was uh, had great promise. He was trying out for the Olympics. Good kid. Father was always careful. Watched where he was, where he was going, when he what things he could go to in the evening and things like that. His father looked every day. He'd be waiting for his son at two thirty in the afternoon. He, was, he expected to be walking down the street, come into the house, do his homework and whatever else after school. And on this one day, around the same time, he hears a gunshot, looks out the door, and his son's laying in front of his house on the sidewalk with his brains, yeah. literally on the, on, the, on the sidewalk. And and to listen to this story and the disrespect that was shown to him, I actually, Congressman Gutierrez, I was down there testifying. Chicago, right? Yeah. He's, he's decided not to run again. Thank well, goodness. That's somebody found some dirt on him, but that's a whole different Well, story. you know, let me tell you, he, <laughs> he, this guy, I listened to him after, the, as these two parents were testifying, and the fa that father I just told you about was one of them. And after the father finished testifying, he said, don't you, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Aren't you, don't you feel ashamed that your, your son's being used and you're allowing your son to be used for political purposes here? The, the, I, would I jumped, thought Trey I would have jumped over the bench Let me tell you. Rang his neck. I'll tell you one thing. Trey Gowdy just about did. Yeah. And he followed him right out, right out afterwards, and went up to his office. I wasn't in there for the conversation, but I can imagine what it was. Yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't pull any punches. I mean, how disgraceful! Trey. But 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 when you're an elected leader, a member of Congress, mm -hmm. 
How do, you, how do you look the people in the eye that elected you and say, you know what, I want you to be less safe than I otherwise know you can be? Yeah, there's an obvious disconnect. For political reasons. Yeah, I don't get it. I just, if you break the law, you break the law. Just, you know, everybody's, everybody says, hey, man, if some guy breaks in your house, like even if your political beliefs are at that, if right. breaks in your house and steals something, I don't care who you are, they should be held accountable and pay the retribution. Of course. Of course. It's what it is. That's like the lowest level, you know. Now, right. You know, you're talking about murder and, and people losing their lives or limbs. Come on. I mean, at what point is it stupid? You mentioned Trey Gowdy. Uh, there's also another bill that's up. Uh, it was reintroduced, uh, brought forth by Trey Gowdy and, again, uh, Bob Goodlett. But it was renamed in memory of uh, two California deputies that were killed by an illegal immigrant. who was Davis Oliver on. Act. Davis Oliver Act. Yeah, but the problem with the Davis Oliver Act, well, here's where I see it. A new provision to permit the, dis the designation of street gangs <clears throat> whose alien members and associates become deportable upon that designation. There's a level of due process there. And I'm, surpri I'm surprised Trey, who's a constitutionalist at heart, hard fought. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I haven't researched it enough, but to me it sounds like you're getting designated as a gang member and the due process wasn't served correctly. I don't know how much proof there is involved to yeah. make you designated as a... You understand where I'm getting Sure. Because I'm a constitutionalist at heart, and uh, I want everybody to have their rights from the first all the way out. No matter what, what affects you, no matter what color you are, I want you to have your constitutional rights, and I don't want them to be infringed in any, in any form or fashion. So here, although I step on my, on my tongue when I say this, I'm also speaking about an illegal alien who's designated. Right. It's not, it's, it's not a... It's not a uh, a citizen, so the rights aren't really offered to them. Although there is some constitution, there is some uh, case law that you know they sure. are offered rights. But I think that, I think under Davis Oliver, they clearly would have to be clearly certified that that they were associated with the gang. It would be difficult <clears throat> to just say you're associated with the gang um, because they they do have due process anyway. Yeah. So so I but I but I think look the, the big the big value if Davis Oliver passes and Kate's law passes. All this nonsense about the detainers and everything else goes away because Davis Oliver will give law enforcement across this country, not just the feds, but local law enforcement, the authority that is uh, granted to the federal ICE agents on immigration, where we can't exceed that federal law, but we can impose that, that law. The only thing you can't do <clears throat> is... Uh you can't exceed the relevant federal code, but it also prevents Correct. you guys from actually doing the deportation yourselves. Correct. You but we can to, do the arrests you can and, do and the everything arrests, else. But you have to do the uh, thing. Correct. Now, um, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, I had a, gosh, happens a lot to me. I got so much going on in my head right now. The, uh, oh, here it is. Now, when you're sitting down at these meetings in D.C. or within the state, within law enforcement, we discussed this the last time, how the chief is almost a politicized position and the reason behind it. You know, they're trying to make their living, they gotta follow, they gotta listen to their boss. Everybody has a boss, everybody has to listen, you know, your boss is me, the constituents. That's and, right. You know, everybody and the chief's boss is the mayor, whose boss is the constituents as well. Behind closed doors, is there a feeling like as law enforcement, like, man, these damn politicians are handcuffing us from doing our job correctly? Is that the is that the feeling that you get amongst your colleagues at these National Sheriff's Association meetings, at these uh, uh, police chiefs meetings that you attend, at these uh, regional task force trainings and meetings that you attend. Is that the, the, is that the underlying tone amongst all, all the members? Oh, there's no question about it. And what I would tell you is in Washington at the National Sheriff's Conference every year, <clears throat> every other year we have the major city chiefs that sit with us for two days in meetings. When Eric Holder was in there uh, in, under the Obama administration, I can remember uh, Chief Flynn, who used to be our public safety director, who was the chief now in Milwaukee, saying to Eric Holder, what this administration has done is undermine law enforcement and caused our officers to hesitate when they shouldn't be hesitating. And I actually had remember that. Everything, yeah, it had everything to do with this whole idea of, of undermining our ability. Uh, look, <clears throat> the FAA... Federal Aviation Administration, FCC, are all regulated by Congress. The rules are made. If you were to say, as the head of uh, New Bedford, the mayor of New Bedford, listen, we, we have an airport here. 
we, we, we don't want to fly to North Carolina, but we have to go this route that takes us almost a half hour out of the way, costs us more fuel. We have to, can't be as competitive on our prices. And uh, <clears throat> Mansfield says, well, we got an airport too. And we, we, we like to go down to Delaware, but we have to go this sort of roundabout route that takes us more. And we pay, both petition, yeah, we petitioned Congress for the last 10 years to change these, and they won't. So you know what? We're just going to go the fastest route that costs us the least amount of money. Can you imagine the chaos in the skies? Oh, wouldn't happen. So, right. So why are, why, why are we thinking it's okay to do that with immigration? Because that's, what's, that's the chaos that we're seeing in this country because Absolutely. people have not followed those rules. Absolutely. And it's, it's, <clears throat> it's bewil- it's a, it bewilders me to think that we have rules. Like, why aren't we following them? Like, isn't that like there's, there's actually rules already laid out. There are laws that aren't being followed. There are laws that are not being uh, – they just, they just, hey, the heck with it. I don't care. Well, imagine teachers in the school. The, the, yeah, pre- exactly. the principal lays out there's certain, there are certain laws or rules you follow, but each teacher says, you know what, I don't like those rules. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. What, what would the education system look like? You'd have and a lot of pink slips. <clears throat> you had a lot of pink <laughs> slips and, and some kids who are going to be left behind. Yeah. So, Unfortunately, that's the truth. <clears throat> yeah, so it's really, this really boils down to we're a country of laws. They are put in place and they were voted on for reasons. If you think that the times have changed where those don't apply anymore, mm-hmm. then you appeal through the process to Congress or, in the case of the state, yep. the legislature here. And then if they change those laws, then that's the new law and everybody follows it. But you don't decide if it doesn't meet my, my guideline or my deadline, then you know what? I'm going to just the heck with the law. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it my way, and I'll create a special class of people that will be that's not treated differently. Yeah, that's not how it works. That's not how it's supposed to be. Um, you follow the rules, and there is a process. We talked about due pro. I talked about due process, and that's how it is. Right. It's legislation. People vote on it, and then it gets passed up, and then people amend it and do everything. And then the final product, that's what you're supposed to follow. Right. You know, right. you're not just supposed to, ah, oh, the heck with it. We're going to do what we want to do. Right. Let's, let's divert now from that. I mean, it is what it is. We're going to hopefully uh, we do – Get some sense on the uh, some sensible uh, people up in Congress that will vote on these things and stuff that actually shouldn't even have to be voted on. But well, I would only tell you if I may just quickly sure. um, that it, yeah, we do need we do need people who are not institutionalized uh, to serve in our Congress. But I would tell you um, over the it's going to take some time to get a, a good majority of people who aren't institutionalized. Uh, and it's on both sides. <clears throat> on both sides of the aisle, no question about it. Um, so what I would say, though, for the immediacy of the things that need to be dealt with now for the safety of the people of this country, the only people who have the ability to make that happen are the people. Yeah. They are, it, is, it is all of us because, as I said, the people who serve in Washington work for us. Yes. We don't work for them. And they aren't working for us. They're spending a lot of their time. Think about this, this beginning of this Congress. How, much, how many hours have been spent on arguing back and forth about this one did this, this one did that, all the scandals, all the investigations. And in the meantime, we got people who are out there in the community suffering, mental health issues that you're trying to get going, and other people trying to, trying to deal with real issues that aren't even being talked about because they're too busy doing everything but what we hired them to do. So if we're going to make these changes and we want to move this country forward, the power is with the people. Absolutely. And it goes back to what I was saying. Write your congressman. Yes. Write your senators. Call them, write them. Local, too. Start at the local level. One thing I have noticed is that you can make the most difference locally at first, and then you snowball it out that way. Uh, Something you've been a long-serving 20 years now, Sheriff? 20 years. 20, 20 years, yeah. Christian uh, Farland is part of the uh, New Bedford Forward Group, and they actually just did the four-year term. They got it on the ballot. Him and I are introducing uh, term limits next year. We're going to get the signatures for that to start off in New Bedford. And the reason why is eventually I'd like to get these guys that are in Congress. we got 88-year-old guys in Congress. I know you're a little older than me. I don't want to talk about age or anything. But at a certain point, you know, you got to go and play some golf. Yeah. Get away, you know what I mean? you got to get some fresh blood in there. And at that point also, here's the, here's the thing. People complain about lobbyists, and lobbyists is the problem. Lobbyists are going to be there no matter what. Yeah. 
You know, if you let them in and you monitor it, you can actually control them a little bit. So that's what we do. The real solution to lobby is, is term limits. Because by the time, because I truly believe, like you said, the uh, for the most part, police officers, firefighters, politicians all start off for the right reasons. They want to make right. a change. They want to do it right. But man, it, after after eight or nine trips down to the Gulf of Mexico for that one day tour of the oil rig, and then they put you up in a first class room in Mexico for the rest of your week, you and your family and all that. You do that a few times. It's human nature. They got your claws in you. Yeah. Oh, no question. And yeah. uh, and. and and, you know, the other part of it is <clears throat> when it comes to elected officials, and I, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but basically once once they get in, they do go down there and they, they really do want to make a difference, but then they start to understand to get anything done. If I file a bill today, I may not see it for a year and a half. And when yeah. I see it, I may not recognize it because it got so discombobulated and watered down. And what happens is it, when they get under the dome, that becomes the world. Not the world that they were elected to serve on the outside, yeah. and it all becomes insider baseball, and it becomes jockeying for this, jockeying for chairmanships, jockeying for this, that, and the other thing, and yeah. positioning on on partisan lines and things like that. And you, and I you think, know the inner workings a little better than I do, so you know I take your word for it that you well, kind of get lost in the in the. I think most people see it. I think you do too. I think it's. Um, I don't know that I know it any better. Um, I think I've just been around it uh, enough. That maybe it's it's even more clear to me and apparent because yeah. of of the years I've seen it going back twenty years when I tried to work on immigration reform and it and I and I knew when we got it, this bill through the House and I heard it's not going to go through the Senate because the presidential year I was like okay here we go and not much has changed totally different topic but kind of the same <clears throat> one quick question before we move on how do you feel about just you cannot attach bills to each other we vote on this and that's it I, I like it I like it. And that's it. Here's your name on this. We're not going to add your bill to get your vote. We're not going to add your bill to get your vote. And, you know, they're doing it right now with the uh, National Reciprocity, H.R. 38. They're trying to now it pass the House. Uh, I'm speaking to anybody that's not familiar. Your concealed carry license. If you have a concealed carry license, and even in the states that don't issue it, you don't have reciprocity unless you have that license. So, you, you know, places like, oh, they're like, oh, but places that have no restrictions, like Kentucky's uh, constitutional carry, you can carry but they won't give you a concealment uh, permit unless you take the class. It's actually way stricter than Massachusetts to get this. You know. Right. But you can open carry without one. And you can own, but you can't conceal carry without this permit. So all these places that you think have the lenient uh, laws on firearms, you actually have to get this permit in order to travel like a driver's license. Like I'm going to New York. Some of that I'd probably like to have my firearm. I can't yeah. do it, you know. You can't do it, especially in New York. Gosh. Right. Um, so... But the bill, the bill, a bill that's filed, right? Yeah, and it passed. But it hit, let me finish my point. Yeah, oh, so now Feinstein, now it's going to the Senate. Feinstein, who's a gun grabber, is now going to attach her nicks, which is going to get... I'm all about background checks. I'm a firearms guy. I don't think any felon should own a firearm. I think right. automatically judges should put you in federal prison if you get caught with a gun, get you away from your friends and your family. That way you put the fear of God. Like if you're in New Bedford playing with guns illegally, you're getting sent to St. Louis. Have fun. You want to see the gun violence go down real right. fast? That's oh, yeah. how you're going to do it. Oh, Every yeah. single gun charge, federal, get them out to Oregon. Oh, gosh, I don't want to do this. It'll happen like this overnight. Oh, no question. So I'm not, I'm not afraid to say as a firearms advocate, I'm okay with background checks. But what I'm not okay with is when you start tying into the VA and guys that are actually, you know, fought in our country that, oh, you can't have a gun because, you know, you had that day, man, that, you know, you kind of – Lost a little. Well, man, I saw two of my buddies get blown up. Of course I had that day. Right. Give me my due process. Give me my rights that I fought for. Right. That I was out in Iraq for. That's where I lose. That's what they don't see, you know. So now they're attaching that to it to get votes. Yeah, and to, yeah, it's to get votes. It's to, sometimes it's to sink a bill. Uh, exactly. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll put something in there that they, they know the other side could never agree to. Because they just don't want that bill to pass. Exactly. So it's it's and 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 going back to your important point, which is let the bill stand alone on the merits of the bill, not on not on leveraging or extorting another group to go along with what you want as a trade off, or well, I won't vote for it. But then it'll be black and white. <clears throat> Why did you vote no? Why did you vote? That's yes? That's exactly right. But if you attach it, then you have. More yeah, you reason to yeah. yeah, I couldn't do that because of this that. and because of that. No, man, if you just did line <laughs> item voting and that's it, you did vote on that exact bill. Right, it's going to put you on record. Right, 
Right, and as, as it should. As it should. Look, the voters don't have to agree with every decision you make because you're in the midst of the things all the time. But you should at least have the courage to say, this is why I believe it, this is why I voted for it. And nine, nine times out of ten, most voters, even if they didn't agree with you, will probably go, you know what, okay, it isn't on every issue yep. that I disagree. And even on this one where I might feel very strongly about it, at least I appreciate the fact that that elected official I put there voted what he really or she really believed was the right thing for me, even though I didn't agree with it. And I respect them for that. Yep. They'll give you, the, they, they'll respect that more than they will if you put your finger up in the air and start playing games with it and trying to soft pedal it and all of that. Maybe you appease them, but you put them in a situation that down the road they're going to be seriously harmed or remember their family is because you play politics Absolutely. rather than do the right thing. It just puts you, it holds you accountable, and I'm all <clears throat> about accountability. Right. You do something, you're accountable for it. I do something, I'm accountable for it. Everybody should be. Right. Let me move on. Last thing I'm going to talk about okay. because poor John is out there waiting, and we, oh. gotta, we have I got to get John on, and I went way over with you, which happens all the time. I actually been told by my producer that I'm only allowed starting the new year, which I'm lucky because that means I'm having a show still. Uh, one guest per per episode. Uh, I really want to tie this in. It's kind of funny. You won Newsmaker of the Year, but also quickly. You did a huge Salvation Army uh, for Christmas. Yeah, we've been doing cruise. that for you for, for a year, ever since I've, I've been here. Um, and we, we basically have the inmates working for, prior to Thanksgiving all the way through. Yep. They, uh, it's a great program for them. They get a chance to reach out to their, to their community. Some of, They may live in that community for these families who are less fortunate. They at Thanksgiving, Up to Thanksgiving, when the, all the food is donated and so forth, they're, they're sorting it, organizing it, preparing the boxes, carrying the boxes out to the cars when these families yeah. come who don't have and then And then now preparing for Christmas <clears throat> for kids that are less fortunate and helping Salvation Army to get all that stuff together for, the, for, for creating a, uh, somewhat of a Christmas for some of these kids who otherwise wouldn't have it. Exactly. And it's, um, it's you know, nice. I work for the community service program, <clears throat> as you know, through the trial court. And uh, every single time I bring a work crew out, we do work like that. The stick and pick stuff they all hate. You yeah. know, picking trash for anybody that doesn't know the term. Uh, the dumb stuff, sweeping up the parking lot, they don't care about that. But I'll tell you one thing. Every single time I do a project like you're discussing with my guys, it changes them inside a little bit. No question. And they're proud of it, and they actually enjoy doing it, and they wish they could do it 365 days while they're doing time. Yeah, we, we, uh, they estimate that just each year the work that these guys do. If the, if the Salvation Army had to hire people to do the work these inmates are doing, it would cost about $25,000. That's $25,000 of services that are now going to people because Excellent. we have inmates who are able to give back. Start to, to, to sort of get a sense. You're not going to get that sense of what's happening in your community and the people that are, that are less fortunate. Knowing that, you know, you're being thanked, that they're, we, our inmates were over at the, uh, at the, the big event at uh, the uh, Bedford Police, where they collected all the yes, supplies. Yes, I remember that for the stuff for Puerto Rico. Yeah, and we had a group of inmates there, and they worked their butts off. But I'm going to tell you what, what was really, really amazing uh, for them and for us, for all of us, all those volunteers that were all there gathered around the inmates at the end of the night and gave them a big round of applause. Yeah. It was a moving experience for them. It's nice. And it, and it reinforced to them that when you do good things, Community, things happen. The community accepts it, and yep. the community gives you gratitude and shows you their appreciation for you. Yep. You know, they're not a drain on, on society. And that's how we want them to leave, Absolutely. because we want them better prepared with more tools yeah. than that's, the toolbox. That's part of my thing with funding and getting the appropriate programming for your facility. Important. You want to legislate stuff, you know, you can <clears> only, <throat> by law, 90 days or less, guys on pre-release. Right. That's a legislation, I believe, right? I don't think that's a... No, well, that a, six months. Six months now? Okay, yeah. yeah. Man, if you can classify these guys back to a year, do it back to a year. You know what I mean? Get the funds and the, and the and to get more work crews out there in the, in the area, you know. Treat them and do all the good stuff like you're doing out with the pre-release yeah. uh, and all the other work crews you do. Sheriff, I got to cut you loose. I hey, John, I always and, and enjoy talking with to, you. And you have to go back. Keep I want up. to set up a meeting with you soon. So yeah, that'd be great. That project. That'd uh, be great. From within. But keep um, up your good work. You I'm know, trying, it's I'm uh, you know what I it's, found uh, something I like. Well, you know what it's and, and, and the things that you're doing to make a difference in the community and using this venue is huge because people listen to it and it gives them a chance to start to think about doing it themselves and that's how you build community and and you're doing a great job at it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Yeah, appreciate have it. yourself a great night, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey guys, that was the sheriff again. Uh, I told you, I told everybody that it just wouldn't be uh, the Republican Fox News talking points that y'all uh, were talking about on, on uh, Facebook earlier. The sheriff uh, is multifaceted and I, and I wanted to bring up some serious issues that we've touched upon uh, besides the uh, immigration stuff and all the stuff that you guys on the uh, left or left of center kind of hate about the sheriff. Uh, there's a lot more to him and what he does at his department. Uh, J uh, Josh, you want to run, we also have to, uh, Edwin Cartagena is helping me out with my uh, Toys for Tot drive. He set me all up through United, New Bedford United. He got me all the contacts I needed to make sure that these gifts that we're going to collect, me and my team, uh, are going to get to the proper channels. But Edwin has also been on the forefront of helping out these people in Puerto Rico and helping out the citizens that have come to this uh, area. But he's also doing a fundraiser. Uh, Josh, can you play that video for me, please? What we found was a town where people are just trying to survive. Puerto Rico, it. people are still being rescued. All of Puerto Rico is still without power. Many families are relocating to New Bedford as a result of Hurricane Maria. They need various supplies that we take for granted every single day. We need your help. On December 16th, Gifts to Give will be hosting a dinner and dance. 100% of the proceeds will go to these displaced families. You can purchase your tickets at giftstogive.org. Guys, do what you can. Help out causes, help out the community. Edwin's doing God's work out there. He's helping out, uh, you know, the people that have been affected by these uh, tragedies. If you find it in your heart and you can afford a ticket to get out there, even if you can't go to the, to the event, buy a ticket. Uh, all the information is on giftstogive.org uh, backslash December 16th. And also, if you can donate a, a gift card or a toy at one of the locations I spoke of earlier, Let's make a difference. Let's let's help. With each act of kindness by an individual in our area, it's going to help rebuild our area to the point that we want. If you do one nice thing a week, if everybody had done that in this area, everybody, you do one kind act for somebody other than yourself, you'll make a difference. And you'll see things change very, very quickly in our area. Our next guest tonight is long overdue, and I do apologize, John. John has been very patient out there, while the sheriff and I, who both of us have an issue with uh, talking too much. Uh, John, thank you for coming back. Oh, no problem. Yeah, it's not as if I had something to do with the schools or anything, because I can't go. <laughs> so. It was the, 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 ding, uh, the little drum roll uh, joke. That was, a, that was a, As you all know, John is now school committee elect. Uh, John will be sworn in, if he's allowed to be sworn in, in January. John ran on the platform that he's going to get our schools back to where they need to be, and one of the ways that he proposed, and that 6,000 voters, 6,000 plus voters decided to vote for him was to remove the superintendent, Dr. Pia Durkin. Unfortunately, uh, there's been some fallout since your election. Uh, you had an issue at the school department. We won't get back into it. It's well documented. Uh, a no trespass order has been issued on you. She tried to get a restraining order on you, but <laughs> right. was told that that's not how it works. Uh, there's no personal relationship, and there's, there's no cause uh, for you to, mm -hmm. to be issued. So she wasn't granted one. Well, she was told she wasn't going to be granted one, so she decided not to. Yeah, to Which do it in the best interest of the, the district. To the best interest. Where basically it was, they were going to tell her, no, you're not getting one. And that's the fact. Now, John is a father, a school committee elect uh, member who is unable to step on school property. Just wrap, wrap, around, wrap that around your head. Uh, just It's crazy to me. Because of a what we'll say a, uh, a contentious conversation at the school department where someone didn't want to meet with an official who she'd have to answer to within a few months. Yeah. Or not even just have a discussion, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it was, it was that, it was that bad. And so, and so it didn't last long, but 
you promised the voters that you were going to get Pia Durkin out, and then uh, what? Four hours after that incident, she yeah, I, I don't that know. She I think <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, timing uh, sometimes is impeccable. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, it was certainly an issue that I think I drove during the campaign. Uh, that by the end of the campaign, uh, everyone was on board with at least not renewing her yeah. contract, which was a change for some of them from the beginning of the campaign. When you say everyone, you're talking about your future colleagues, mm -hmm. whether they be school committee members, even the mayor kind of, after the election, yep. sat back and said, hey, we may not have her in our future plans. Well, I think we, I think there was a clear message sent by the voters. Yes. Um, you know, and, and they certainly, not, well, not the voters, the voters obviously wanted me in there, uh, but I, I think the establishment, that is why they're so upset that I'm in there. Uh, because I'm a loose cannon. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 just the way it is. You're the wild card. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, the fact is, you know, I was meeting with some teachers this evening, and it's, you know, it's about doing what's right for our children. Yeah. You know, this isn't about polishing a political resume uh, that I served on the school committee, and next year I'm going to, you know, run for something else. Uh, no, th th this is it. You know, I... I Saw something wrong. I felt I needed to do something about it. I felt that strongly about it. Now, John, unfortunately, with this no trespass order, like I had stated mm -hmm. earlier, and like you have stated earlier, one of the main reasons why uh, you ran was to make sure the schools were going to work for your child. Right. With this no trespass order, you are unable to attend school functions. Right, yeah. We had which a, include? A parent-teacher conference we had uh, last week or the week before. Uh, which my wife and I went down, and uh, I parked on the street because I can't go on the school property. Uh, so my wife went in. She said, well, I'll just conference call you in if that's all right. And I said, yeah, that's fine. You know, if it's all right with the teachers, just do a conference call, and I'll sit out here and wait that's for crazy. you. That's uh, crazy. Before my wife could even do that, the teacher said, oh, no, we know he has a uh, no trespass order. We'll, we'll come out to the sidewalk and talk to him. So they accommodated you. They did. Uh, you know, and it was fantastic. And, and you know, real big shout out to those teachers. I mean, that, that was great. Um, was there a need for it? No, there was no need to have to go through all that uh, because there shouldn't be a no trespass order. It's strictly, this is a vindictive thing. Um, so next week, uh, Tuesday, my daughter uh, is going to be nominated for the uh, National Honor Society at Keith. And she's in the sixth grade. And we received a letter yesterday saying, you know, you're invited. And, well, I can't go. You can't attend. No. So I called the principal's office this morning and left a message uh, asking him to return my call uh, that I wanted to discuss with him some of the, the, the thing on Tuesday night, the event. Um, I had also sent an email to the superintendent's office, to her administrative assistant, uh, that I would still like to speak with her. Uh, she called me back. It was a very brief conversation. Um, I asked her, I said, when well, are you going to lift a no trespass order? Uh, she says, I, uh, I really can't say. Um, and I, I really wanted to say something else, but I said, well, I said, if you're going to continue with this childish behavior, then I think we don't have anything to talk about. And I hung up. So she has a no trespass order on you, but she still finds it okay to talk to you on the phone, which kind of doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't make any sense that she has, that, that, that she has this on me. So um, a couple hours later, uh, I get an email from Dr. Durkin. Okay. Uh, so apparently the principal must have called her up to ask if it was okay for me to go to this event because uh, I didn't ask her and I'm not about to ask her uh, if I can go to this event. Um, and so she sent me a letter saying that she would grant me permission uh, to attend the hour and a half uh, that this event is only on this day uh, between these hours. Uh, I, I found it somewhat that, that she was just talking down to you again, that she was just turning the screws. To me, that was her idea of control. I'm going to grant you permission well, that was to nice go of her, this to go day. see your student that's a great performer yeah, in it, the system. Very good. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's, you know, I think this is uh, her trying to exert her control, and it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, we've already spoke to my daughter about it. Um, I am not stepping on school property until the trespass order is completely lifted. And that's what I've asked the other school committee members for that I've spoken with. Uh, hopefully it gets discussed on Monday night. Uh, I meet with the mayor on Tuesday morning. Um, and hopefully we can have this worked out by then because I think this is 
This is ridiculous. It's, it's vindictive. Uh, apparently, she has a track record of this. Uh, I had heard quite a bit about it on the campaign trail. Uh, and, you know, said, yeah, okay, you know, I, you know, I understand this stuff happens. Uh, Chris Burley, I have it on next week, uh, foyered. The week after. The week after. His, his kid's getting surgery next week, so um, he can't make it. the paperwork, and apparently it's like 213 pages worth of no trespass orders. Um, during her tenure. During her tenure. And to me, that just seems a lot. And from what I, I gather from the parents that I spoke to and the former employees, it's when she's challenged uh, that she pulls this. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's something, something to be said here. So it's our go-to move. Yeah, and, and for me, this was, this was two months that I wanted to devote to educating myself mm -hmm. about the New Bedford public school system and talking to the department heads, finding out the programs, yes. and what's going on in the school so I have a better feel to make these Absolutely. decisions when we move on. Um, now it's just going to have to wait until after the first. Uh, but I, I still see uh, this is an, you know, an issue, but she is not going to run rampant. Um, uh, you know, I said on the campaign trail, uh, I'm not going to let the superintendent run rampant like she has. I don't care if she's got one month or six months left. It's going to stop. Yeah. Now, last week, I, I actually called for her to resign immediately. Uh, and the reason why I did so, and I also asked that if she doesn't, to the current school committee mm -hmm. members, which include the mayor. Right. Man, get her out of there. She's impeding the process. You now have a no trespass order against you. And part of your future job, which you can actually start working on now, because that's what you plan on doing, that's right. what you wanted to do, was to find her a replacement mm -hmm. and find a good one right. that will move New Bedford forward. At what point does she realize that she's just a lame duck and is just creating issues? Yeah, and, 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 you know, and that's something I am concerned about, um, is that she is going to continue... Um, the behavior patterns uh, that she has. And I'm saying it's, it's got to stop. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I said it on the campaign trail, and I'm going to say it now, and I'll say it after I'm sworn in. Th th this is going to stop. Uh, we, we cannot have someone who wields her authority so loosely as she does yeah. uh, in issuing you know, trespass orders uh, and speaking to people the way she does. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I'm in a position of leadership at times, mm -hmm. I, you know, and you have been in the Navy as well. She's actually, and I've had several people come up to me, educators, mm -hmm. pulled the, excuse me, do you know who I am? <laughs> at the school. I mean, how do you leave like that? You know, it's just, when you're at that point where you say that you have like the... the right brain to say hey do you know who i am once you do that you lose me mm -hmm. and once i heard that about her i said you know yeah you know and, and amazingly when i met with her a couple of weeks ago that was the first time i've, I've ever spoken to this yes. woman um and you know to be told to sit down take notes and uh, i'm going to lecture you now um geez that, that's just not the way it works um you know and, and so you know so there's this concern um you know, especially if there's any job hires uh, in, in the next six months, I, I think that should be a concern to the, to the school committee, uh, that, that we need to watch that, uh, watch, the, watch those new hires, the people that she's bringing in. When you spoke to other members about stuff mm -hmm. like this, I'm sure the conversation has come about where, where, where I just said. If she doesn't leave before that, what, are you guys ready to get rid of her? Have you guys had that conversation with any? I certainly am. Uh, yeah. um, I, I don't think I, I think everybody would just prefer her to finish out the school year. Uh, what's the reason? What's the point of her finishing the school year at this point? What does she bring to the table? What could she do within the next six months? That is, if New Bedford's going to move forward, why have her there still? Have, why the, have the position you having somebody in the position for the next six months while it's going on. She said she wants to help with the transition. I'm really reaching to believe that because she's not helping with mine. Yeah, with a contentious So if she's so concerned behavior. about if she's so concerned about a transition, um, considering that she's to, she works for the school committee, yeah. and I will be a sworn in member of the school committee uh, come January, you'd think it would be in her best interest to help me with a transition, but obviously not. Well, here's my thing. You may have the person within at this point to take over that position. 
We may. Uh, and I'm sure the school committee already has their eyes on internal candidates. Mm-hmm. I Why not give that person the chance to show what they have for six months, almost like a long-term in-house mm-hmm. interview? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would hope that when we do advertise that we do see some internal, uh, and if not internal, at least local candidates. And if they are qualified, I mean, I have, they, they need to be looked at, and they should be looked at. It goes back to what the sheriff and I were talking about. This is not about the DESE. Yeah. Telling us, these are your three choices, and they're all lousy. Yeah. It goes back to what the sheriff and I were talking about. Ask the experts, the people within. Mm -hmm. It would be really, really nice to get somebody that's been boots on the ground. Absolutely. That knows the system, that knows the department, that Mm -hmm. knows the administrators to have that job. Yeah, no, I think it would. And and the amount of corporate knowledge that you're retaining is, is huge. Uh, because I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna see some additional management changes on this at the school department uh, with the result of the superintendent's resignation. Uh, so I think, I think you may see a few more. Are you insinuating some of her, uh, some of her minions, minions as you call them? Um, yeah, yeah. I would not be surprised to see some resignations forthcoming over the next six to eight months. So there will be a big shakeup. Why not start it sooner than later? Yeah, you know, I, and anybody who's that close to her, as far as I'm concerned, uh, does not deserve the job to be in charge of educating my children if they are willingly pulling the wool over the school committee's eyes and showing them statistics that don't reflect what's actually going on in the schools. Bring up some of those statistics. Uh, those, th- yeah, that 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 will be coming up. Uh, yeah. yeah, we. I'm going to wait until uh, the first of the year, and once we get sworn in, and we can actually do some work, All right. um, we'll, we'll, we will start taking care you of. You have that. some inside intel that you can't release. I get you, <laughs> John. What, what? 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 I mean, you got less than a month now. Mm-hmm. What's the plan? Lay low for the next month? Yeah, you know, and in fact, I told one of the school committee members that morning um, that I was served the no trespass order. I said, I'm, I told him, I said, I'm going to make one more trip. I'm going to go see her, see if she'll, see, you know, talk yeah, to her. of course. Um, and if she doesn't, I guess then I just cool my heels until January 1st. Um, and that's what I've done. Uh, today was the, you know, the, the first day that I've actually said, hey, you know, I'm waiting to talk to you. But if she doesn't want to lift the no trespass order, then there's nothing further that her and I have to talk about at this point. Will you be able to do your job effectively with the no trespass order? Uh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely and not. Let the people know why. Uh, number one... The school committee has not been shown the reality of life on a daily basis in the New Bedford Public Schools. Um, And so I have to question everything the superintendent's office puts in front of me as a school committee member now. Um, And the only way to resolve that and find that out is to actually get in the schools and talk to people. And, you know, I'm a hands-on guy. I I want to know what's going on. I want to know school adjustment counselors. I was talking to one this scene. We didn't have school adjustment counselors when I was a kid. So, you know, I'm kind of interested. I I said, you know, look, can you give me a call? I'd like to sit down and talk with you because... I want to know what she does. You know, my kids don't seem have a need for a school, but I'm sure some kids do. I don't really know what they do, and, I, and that's one of the things. You know, I want to find those things out. You have the time. It's an unpaid position, and, 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 and it's an important position. And I have plenty of time. And you have the time where you can actually, like, one thing I proposed, I think it was with you or uh, Josh, is having... Oh, a substitute? A substitute yeah. teach me. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think, I think that's a novel approach, but I don't think that... That would probably be the the best thing to do, um, I don't, and I'll be honest with you. I don't think with the PTSD, I think that would be a little too much for. <laughs> yeah, it'd be, it'd get you going, right? Yeah, yeah. I can tell you one thing. Uh, I hear stories, but and it's 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 rough in there right now, especially in the middle school and high school. Yeah, and, and you know, and and that's the thing. You know, when for instance, um, we'll we'll take last school committee meeting mm-hmm. when she was presenting her data for her evaluation. Um, and knowing that we had an issue with school climate at the middle schools last year that made the papers, and I mean, it was big news, she throws up, these are all the incidents that we have, and they might include tardy slips, and it was like, look, you're trying to present this as information that's highlighting you, but you can't tell us how many of these were actual incidents where 
you know, serious incidents where a child or a teacher was injured. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not telling us that. She's only relieving, uh, so, releasing part so of the So out of that 10,000 or whatever the number was that she threw at the school committee. Yes, sir. How many of those were serious incidents that required the SRO's intervention, required medical intervention? We don't know. And she's apparently not going to come free with the information. To me, that would be extremely important if that was a major issue over the last year. Yeah. I've spoken to a few uh, police officers that have been SROs. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a little thing they do there where they can't really arrest a student. Right. Unless the principal kind of says, yeah, we got to get him arrested. And there's been situations where, man, this guy should get arrested right now. No, I already had one this week that got arrested. I can't do that. Well, because the principals, and I have heard this not from all principals, uh, but some principals feel pressure not to report or under-report a particular incident. Um, you know, I still haven't heard any more about the teacher that was assaulted that day of the Gome School debate. Yeah. Um, you know, other than the secretary at Keith for the principal trying to pass it off as, oh, she was sick and she had to go to the hospital. Um, you know, nothing, nothing's been said of that. And it continues to go on. I hear it from teachers. I hear it from my kids. Um, so, we, we, you know, th this needs to stop and, we, and the school committee as a whole needs to review and look and really hold her accountable for what she is presenting to them. Mm -hmm. um, because what she's presenting is very deceiving and very misleading to the citizens who pay, a, a, I think, an exorbitant salary to her. Seems like uh, we're going to have some fireworks come January, if you're allowed to attend these meetings. We, we may. Well, then, then we'll, the fireworks will be in court. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I hope it doesn't get to that. I, you know, There's really no need for it. You know, this is, uh, you know she's obviously decided to finish up. Um, I'm coming in. You know, I yelled at her once and slammed the door. I, I, I don't get it. And if, if this lady, how she made it to be a superintendent of schools at, you know, almost at, at the top of her profession is, is really, really beyond me. Yeah, especially with the, the Attleboro record. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> John, what would you envision in change in our schools? From what you know so far, like what, what change would you... Something innovative that you want to bring to the New Bedford Public Schools, something different. I don't know if it's, well, maybe it's different to this generation of student, not so much to us. Uh, but I want to bring back the experience of having a teacher teach. Um, you know, I, I, people ask me all the time, I don't remember all my teachers, especially, certainly not the ones in middle school. That was, I, yeah. I hated middle school. Yeah. Um, but I will never forget my fourth grade teacher, Beverly Glennon, at the Mellow Middle School, at Elementary School I can't in Dallas. I remember that name. And she was incredible and fostered such a love of history in me that is still, is still with me today. Um, though that's the kind of teachers, that's what I want teachers to be able to do is impart that kind of knowledge, that enthusiasm about learning. Uh, it could be about science, it could be about math. That's what they have to do is from a script. And our kids are not characters in a movie. You want to remove the standardization type stuff. Y you have to because it's not, it's not benefiting anyone. The only one it's benefiting are the companies that make the tests and people like the superintendent who believe this is the best way to educate our children. You know, um, I don't know about her children. Is it the best way to secure funding? Because that may also be an issue. No, it's not, because there's really no substantial proof that this, these standardized tests provide data to, to safely tie it into funding. Um, you know, there's some, I, I know I've, I've spoken to Josh Amrall, and he's very involved at the state level with the uh, School Committee Association. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that they are working on trying to come up with some other options. But, you know, people are already talking about a moratorium, on MCAS, yes. if we're having question and people that are behind it are s thinking about a moratorium, maybe we should just stop it all together until we get it figured out. Exactly. Uh, because continuing to drag this ha has not done anything for improvement in our children. So, you know, I, I think that's, 
the big thing, but you know, is the big change I think that would be innovative, not so much for us, but for our children is to find is, is to have teachers that, that that are now once again able to enjoy teaching, um, and 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 take their time. Every kid's different. You know, my kid is not a character in a movie. Uh, my child is so much very different than the next child. Uh, and when you have classes that they have allowed to get over thirty students in a class. Um, that, that's ridiculous. How can a teacher provide the interaction uh, that they need? How can they engage the students when you have that many in a class? Uh, you know, 20, I think, is already pushing it. Uh, you got 37, 38 in some classes. Yeah, over in Amanda, and it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things that, that still need to be addressed. Um, you know, and I, and I hope next time I'm on the show that we have some really positive things to talk about. And, you know, some of those are, you know, I, I'm looking forward to is setting up the search committee for the new, new superintendent. Absolutely. Uh, I'm looking, you know, very forward to working with my colleagues on the school committee to accomplish that. Yep. Um, Do you have a good relationship with the current ones? Are you able to sit down, call them? And yeah, you know, actually, I, I've had conversations with, uh, with Chris, Josh, and Bruce. Mm -hmm. and, now you're and I'm going to be meeting with the mayor. With the mayor. Um, and, you know, every one of them, and Bruce Oliveira, as you might recall, I beat up pretty bad at times on the campaign trail. Yeah. And, I mean, him and I had a wonderful two-hour conversation one morning. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not, this is my way of the highway. I'm looking to work with people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they've seen that. Um, the superintendent obviously doesn't want to have that kind of discussion. That's what I've been trying to get with her is just, just sit down and hash this out. It's not. Yeah. John, what are you doing for Christmas? Are you any toy drives, anything else like that that you're getting involved in this year? Or um, you, you waiting to get more of a... No, well, my, my, my motorcycle club does a lot of... Yeah. We do a lot of toy stuff around this time of year, so we have another event this Saturday. Um, down yeah. down in Wareham at Stevie B's and Onset. Yeah? Um, what are you guys doing? A dance, a Christmas party. Awesome. So yeah, fundraiser. Uh, yep, yep. And if you if you go, please bring a toy, uh, pack a new toy. Um, awesome. Uh, we had a great event with uh, the Fire and Iron Motorcycle Club uh, last week. Yeah. Uh, so you know we you know so we do a lot a lot of things like that. And of course around our house, we, you know we have the family over. And being a, a multi faith family, um, you know we get to celebrate Hanukkah and and Christmas. So the, the kids get the best of both worlds. Nothing uh, nothing like. Uh Erasing the lines between the two and just everybody enjoying everybody. That's it. You know, and, you know, do, do a, you and respect it's, it's a, your it's beliefs. It's you about family my beliefs and just enjoy each other. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's so important. And uh, you know, we have a lot of kids that that don't get that um, that understanding, and school's the only place they they can get it. Yeah. And and if and if we're holding our teachers to a script and 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 saying your performance is based on this child's performance. Um, we're doing our children wrong. Absolutely. Anything else? You got one minute. No, I, you know, everybody out there, have a great holiday. I want to thank you for your continued support. Uh, remember, go to the school committee meeting on Monday at 6 o'clock at Keith Middle School. Um, and I'll be there. I can't go in, but I'll be on the sidewalk. So uh, just saying, hey, I'd like to be there, but uh, there's a no trespass order. Call your school committee members. Call them up. Email them. Uh, and that includes the mayor. Let them know this isn't right. She can do if she can do this to me. She can do this to any one of the school committee members. Uh, and and th this is interfering with the basic principle of an election. Oh, I've talked to people. They're they're, they're pretty hot under the collar over this, and uh, it's undermining the process that we that we have in our country of elected officials being able to do their job. Yep. So, but uh, yeah, that's it. Everybody have a great holiday, a safe one. Uh, and look forward to seeing you in the new year, Chris. Yeah, thank you. You'll definitely be on. Uh, well, I'm going to continue. Uh, the youth is very important. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, being a school committee member, you're, you're going to be a major part of it in the city. And uh, hopefully uh, we can get some uh, inside scoops on who's got the lead for the next superintendent. And, yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure um, how much I'm going to. I don't know if I'm the right person to be on the search committee. Yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, think so. I don't think I am. Um, you might you might scare people off. Uh, I'd probably want to be on the you know something like maybe the uh, the school climate committee awesome. uh, facilities. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I don't think the search committee. I, I don't think that's necessarily my cup of tea. Hey, listen. At least you admit what what you want to 
you know so, what your strong points there's are. A, there's other think. people. There's other people on the committee that have those have those strong points for that. Absolutely, and I'm I'm glad you just said that because everybody has their limitations, yeah. and for you to acknowledge, hey, I might not be good for that. You're putting your ego aside, and right there, that statement willing, alone shows that you you are willing to put your ego. I'm willing aside. to work with people. Yeah, you exactly. Know, you know, I, I know how things work. That, um, that's a great, great sign that you just you threw know, out there without even knowing about it. People that actually can see, hey, man, this is a guy that's just, hey, I might not. That might not be for me. Let the guys that are good at it do it, or we'll let the guys that have better patience for that type of thing do it. That's awesome that you can so, push aside your ego and say, hey, that might not be for me. Let me yeah. let me work on something I may be more helpful at. Good for you, John. So. Thank All you. Right. So, thank you so much. Thanks I'll so much. I'll have you on again. Like I said, coming in the spring probably. Fantastic. Fortunately for the show and for me, uh, we're booked out until February. It's awesome. It's That's good, awesome. It's a good feeling, unless people like uh, Dr. Durkin back out on me. You just call me up if she yeah, does. If she does. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chris. John, we'll thank you so thank much. You. Ladies and gentlemen, John Oliveira, school committee elect member, uh, sheriff. Also, thank you for coming. And thank you all for uh, being part of the show and, and your continued support and viewership. I'd, uh, I'd also like to thank everybody involved, uh, not only in the toy drive that I'm pushing, Edwin doing his, uh, his fundraiser, the commercial we played, and all others, John and his motorcycle club. It's a wonderful time of year, and it's actually a time where you actually see people being generous and, and showing commitment to their fellow human being. And... and from Thanksgiving on, you hear these stories about families buying un, uh, underprivileged families gifts and turkeys, and just go the extra mile. Like, man, if we could do that 12 months a year, think about how nice of a place the world would be. Let's not think, let's, let's make Christmas all season long. Let's give, be generous, and be kind to each other. Thank you all. I'll see you next week. I'm working on uh, some human trafficking stuff for next week. Uh, trying to get uh, Dr. David Lemer on to do that as well as other stuff that he's involved with. Uh, and again, thank you for your viewership. Be kind to your fellow human being. Have a great night and thank you for your viewership.